Hello, everyone, and I'm so glad and thankful that we all could be here uh, tonight virtually at our virtual community gathering space. I have wonderful guests with me. I'm so excited. Many of these people have been so instrumental in CBF life and not only CBF life, but in my personal life and in my personal career in ministry. And, and I am just so excited to be with all here with all of you all's smiling faces. Amen. So brothers and sisters, I'm going to start off just by just by talking about just how great I think CBF is and all the great things CBF has done for me. And then we'll merge into this casual conversation. We're going to have a casual conversation tonight and just really make this about um, your journey in CBF, my journey in CBF and how CBF has been a great place for us as a beloved community. Um, my journey with CBF. Uh, really started when I was in um, graduate school. And at my graduate school uh, experience, uh, I went to Candler School of Theology. I was an intern working at, with Student.Go with Taisha and with Lori. And I had an excellent experience doing that. And through being in the party cube, that's where all the interns sat. That's where I was able to really develop my theology, having great conversation partners such as John Mark, John Mark such as Marianne Hildreth, uh, Colleen DeGraff, you know, so many great people that uh, have helped and shaped my theology over the years. And I've just had such a great time and I really enjoyed that in my journey through CBF. And I just wanted you all to talk about your journey through CBF and how you all started with CBF and what that uh, looked like for you all. So let's start with, uh, uh, Dr. McCall, you have an interesting story when it comes to CBF. You're one of those, I, I like to call it, one of those people that shaped the framework of CBF in your beginning time. So tell me about that with you. Well, I was on the staff of the Home Mission Board, Southern Baptist, from 1968 to 91. And uh, in 1991, I started the church. I'd been there 23 years. Felt like my time was finished there and uh, started the church. Shortly after I started the church, I heard that CBF was getting ready to organize. There were some men who were friends of mine, women who were friends of mine, that uh, they were going to start a new movement. Um, interestingly, while I was at the Home Mission Board, many of the pastors that began in CBF in its formation were people who worked with me, especially in the area of racial reconciliation ministries. Um, there were pastors who often invited me to come and help them in projects they were beginning. And I had a number of opportunities, made a lot of friends. When I discovered that it was my friends that were really talking about a new way of doing the Lord's business in a collaborative way, I got excited. I wanted to be a part of it. And uh, I did. Uh, Interestingly, my wife was a secretary in the first office. She worked with David Wilkerson, who was the uh, person responsible for public uh, affairs. So CBF has been in my life ever since it began. And the people who have been, who are a part of CBF have been my friends. And I thank God for the pilgrimage. Well, that is awesome. That you said, I like what you said that it's always been a part of your life in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Even down to your wife, you said being a secretary. That's amazing. Yeah, um, I, I mean, that, that that is phenomenal. So you're deeply rooted in CBF life. Very much so. Very much so. Okay. All right. So, so Casey, you, you know, I, I, I know you're also rooted in CBF life as well. You were a pastor at a CBF church in D.C., and then you uh, graced us with your presence in the <laughs> office at CBF. <laughs> and you then became a part of the CBF family, working, making major decisions. You're in leadership. You've done so many great things. Uh, I, I've always wondered how your journey with CBF began. Sure. Thanks. Thank you for asking. Um, you know, my, my church actually was not a CBF church when I started. I started pastoring in 2006. Seems <laughs> such a long time ago. <laughs> started and it. I had an interesting story because um, I started um, being introduced to CBF in two different ways. One, I was part of a, a program sponsored by the Baptist World Alliance. And 
uh, had the opportunity to travel to Ghana and to be part of that um, that that ga- that gathering, and was introduced. Well, take a step back. In the program that I was in, we were assigned mentors. The mentor that was assigned to me was Erlene Vessel, who was the wife of the former coordinator, executive coordinator um, of CBF, Daniel Vessel. Lovely woman. We had a great time, and she introduced me to Daniel Vessel. As, as the head of um, CBF and a few other um, prominent leaders in Baptist society. At the, around the same time, and again, that was around 2006, and at the same time, um, I received this random call from this pastor from Marcel, North Carolina, by the name of Tommy Justice. It was my first month as pastor, and he called me and introduced himself and, and wanted to know if he could stay in my church building. And... Um, I didn't know who he was. I didn't even know my building had showers in it, but he had been used to bringing mission teams and living in the space, in our church space, for a week or so at a time to then service different communities, uh, different organizations um, in the DC community. And basically what happened was that friendship with Tommy Justice expanded from staying in the building to, to partnership in ministry. Uh, after he would come and bring mission teams and found out the vision of our congregation, wanting to be the presence of Christ in community, that he began to share our story about our congregation and our mission and our vision. And, um, and then additional CBF churches would come and stay and work with us. But what folks did not know um, on their journey to, to minister with us and to work, be co-laborers with us, Our church had just gone through a discernment process. And in that process, we had decided to limit our income by by um, not renewing leases for some of the tenants. We had nine tenants in our in our building and we decided not to renew leases for two. And in that journey. uh, It was a it was an act of faith because um, our giving was not high enough to even maintain me full time or some of the other ministries we were doing. So we trusted God in a prayerful time of, of reducing our tenant income so that we can reimagine ministry and that we would reclaim part of our building space back and begin to use it for our, our church and for community ministry. And so once we did that, and when I told you that Tommy justice, um, uh, uh, appreciated our vision and were co laborers And so when we started our clothes closet and our hunger ministry, they would do can drives and bring food from, from North Carolina. When we started our summer camp, they, um, you know, their youth come, came and served in our congregation. And when other congregations would come up and, um, and minister with us, they happened to be CBF and they did not care that I was woman and they did not care. I was, I was black. And so it was refreshing not to have to be pledged or prove myself that people just wanted to work with us. And that's what gained my affinity for CBF. Well, that's awesome. But there's some key things that I really like that you said about CBF not raising red flags or getting all out of sorts about you being a woman and being African-American. Those are some things that women always face when it comes to ministry. And we always face as African-Americans some kind of barrier even today. But um, CBF has been a great home in which women have been able to flourish, men have been able to flourish, regardless of sexuality and race and gender. And that's something that I really enjoy about CBF. All right, Jewel, now you're coming straight out of Texas. uh, And and we know those Texas Baptists are strong, staunch believers. Amen. So therefore, I, I, I... I, I haven't met you personally, but I'm sure with me being in CBF life, well, our paths will cross at some point uh, again. So tell me about your experience. It's interesting that you would uh, mention the women in ministry and the barriers that we face because my first encounter uh, with CBF was through Baptist Women in Ministry. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Pamela Durso invited me to submit a sermon for a compilation of sermons that she was putting together. Uh, This is what a preacher looks like. And that compilation, that book was released at a CBF gathering. And uh, that was my very first introduction. We actually traveled uh, up north for that uh, book signing and 
amazingly, amazingly, I had a great introduction to CBF. And I'm like, where did all these people come from? And they're Baptists. Uh, so that was actually a really, really great introduction. And, and of course, every year, the Baptist Women in Ministry annual gathering is always held on the Wednesday leading up to uh, the annual session. And so I would just uh, join and uh, be a part of those gathering and begin to develop a love and appreciation. I uh, would stay a couple of days and then, you know, I was attending some pastoral development classes at George W. Truett Seminary. And of course, they were heavily involved with CBF and would encourage uh, the students to attend the annual sessions as well. So between Baptist Women in Ministry and George W. Truett Seminary at Baylor University, uh, that was my introduction to CBF. And, and Baptist Women in Ministry have done, they've, they've done a great job with reaching out to women, making sure women have opportunities and leadership and all that at CBF. I was first introduced to be women at uh, CBF um, General Assembly. And I, that's when I got to see them in action. And I, I mean, they've done a lot of great things. Uh, going back to some of my personal experience, I, I was so excited when I saw you. I left out some things about myself. I did start with CBF as an intern, but CBF has done so much for me personally as far as endorsement for chaplaincy, as far as uh, I was, it, 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 CBF has opened so many doors, even with me having the job that I have right now. Right now, I'm currently the pastor of New Morning Light. Uh, Baptist Church, and it's just through these opportunities of of meeting different people, having great conversations. This beautiful library that you see back here behind me, these aren't all my books. I have to thank Dr. McCall, who donated a lot of his library. All these beautiful books right over here uh, are from Dr. McCall's library. He gave them to me. I even have some, some more of, of Dr. McCall's books over here in this area. Uh, Jim, Jim Smith gave me these books right here. And, and I, I'm pointing all that not to brag about my library, which I take so much pride in, but to point out to the fact that CBF is a community of believers that constantly looks back, looks forward, looks around to see what people need. How can we help this person up next to us? How can we encourage and inspire the people around us, regardless of who they are, regardless of what race they are, regardless of what gender you are, regardless of all of those things, people in CBF truly love and care without any boundaries. And that's something I always enjoy. Now, there's something I really want to get to. And something I really want to speak to since we're in Black History Month and there's so much that comes with that. There's so much to speak to with that. It's without a shadow of a doubt. We all know that CBF is predominantly white. That's not a, that, that, that's not anything new. However, what CBF and what makes CBF unique is the fact that CBF does a great job of acknowledging whiteness acknowledging things of the past that have taken place historically in America, but also has made opportunities for African-American males and females. And I just want to speak to, or I want you all to speak to, at some point, you all's experiences as African-Americans in a predominantly white setting. Um, I'll jump right in and start talk about, like when I was first coming into the office, uh, working at CBF, I... The first people, the first person I met was Lori. Then from Lori, I met Joy. Joy, who's no longer with us, rest in peace. She's deceased now, but she was a beautiful soul in name and in spirit. And then I met Taisha, and they were the first black women that that grabbed me, and they were like my mothers in the office. And I was, I think, I maybe me and one other guy was another black male, but everybody else was white. And as a minority in a majority setting, that can be difficult. However, what I will say that I really enjoyed is the fact that. I didn't feel um, repressed in any way. I didn't feel any racial tension. Everything was warm, everything was inviting. And what I liked is there was encouragement to have conversations that were the tough conversations around race. Advocacy, advocacy and action. Some of the job Mark works so hard with and diligently with is something that I truly enjoy to this day because we went all the way to New York and we went to a church uh, in Brooklyn. I forgot what that church's name is now, but that church was one of the stops on the Underground Railroad. And we got to go down to the basement of the church where they harbored slaves. And they talked about how this all white church broke the law by harboring slaves, where they'd be preaching the gospel uh, in the sanctuary on Sunday, but harboring slaves uh, throughout the week 
and and making sure they got to safety or making sure they got to freedom going up through Canada and that area. And just that experience really transformed me and allowed me to see uh, just how ministry can be done and challenge the status quo and challenge the laws of the land. So I just wanted to you all to just speak very um, quickly about your experiences as a minority in a majority setting. Let's start with you, Jewel. One of the things I greatly appreciate about uh, CBF if, is their openness uh, to be able to hear, listen, um, and not necessarily just interject and say, here's what we're going to do. Uh, one of the great things I experienced was uh, an evening when Susie Painter opened up uh, her room and invited uh, you know, a lot of the African-American individuals who are part of the, the NAMA network and uh, we were introduced to the Angela Project and had a chance to hear from Dr. Cosby. And I was like, wow, you know, this is a really, really important initiative and for, um, you know, the organization to be so open to embracing and partnering with something so important and culturally important uh, to the African-American community. And then, of course, there have been other initiatives uh, that have come up as well. And I appreciate the fact that when I'm at CBF, I don't feel like um, I'm invited to the table and then say, here's what we have and here's what we're going to do. Uh, because so many times you go into spaces, um, you know, they've already poured the water before you get there and basically just laying out a plan. Uh, whereas in this particular initiative, it's, it's, we want to hear your voice. Let's hear your voice. Uh, what is it that you want to say? And they're so open to considering uh, uh, what's going on in uh, the world and addressing it, not hiding under the table, and also not just putting a nice little Band-Aid on it. Um, I love the fact that, you know, we now have the Emmanuel McCall Racial Justice Initiative. So, you know, I'm seeing these developments happening. And uh, again, I don't feel like I'm just invited because uh, I am who I am as it relates to, you know, meeting a quota, but they truly are interested and desire uh, to accept me for all of me, uh, all my crazy ideas and uh, my input at the table and say, we value your your voice, uh, not just because you're Black, but because you're Jewel. That's that's beautiful. I, I like that. I remember that meeting that we had there too. Dr. Uh, Cosby was there. So many of us was there. We took a very nice picture. I remember at that same General Assembly, uh, the CBF staff wore uh, green polo shirts, and, a, and a, I think another one was purple. And I had on a green polo shirt that signified I was a staff in the, the CBF office. And a black guy came up to me. He said, you're the first black male I've seen with the staff shirt on. And he was so taken aback and so thro thrown off. And, and he, he just wanted to follow me around the whole conference and just talk to me. And, and you know, I was excited too, because he was excited. And, and we just talked and talked. He said, I didn't know there were any black males in in in, in the office that worked. I, I, he just stuttered and looked and, and was just so fascinated that, that there was somebody black working in the office. I said, I don't mean to disappoint you, I'm just a little intern, you know, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm in the office, I am in there. And the great part about it is uh, he felt more comfortable seeing someone that looked like him, at least at the table, amen? And that's what CBF is good at doing, not only making sure there's visibility of African-Americans at the table, but also making sure we have a voice at the table as well. Now, Casey, I gotta bring you in on this because there was a day I had a hard time in the office and I was sitting back in that little corner in the party queue, not because I was having a hard time because of what was going on with the staff, but I was in an all white school as a minor as a minority in a majority all white school. I'm in a, a all white job as a minority in a majority. And it was just hard that day, just being black and being a minority. And I was over there just in my feelings and depressed. And Casey came over and said, are you okay? And I tried to lie and say, oh, I'm doing this fine. And Casey, and Casey said, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. We're not doing it. What's going on? And she talked to me with that mother and spirit and poured wisdom into my heart, mind, and soul. Casey, t tell me about your experience. <laughs> well, you know, my, my experience has been slightly different than Jules, actually. It's, it's, it's been, what I have learned about CBF is that there is a spectrum um, in the white population of where they are with race. 
um, you know, there are there are folks that um, are courageous and are willing to fight for justice, for racial justice and are courageous to to operate in black space. And then there are those folks who live in a community that they that they will never run into anybody black and never have to consider black bodies, black community and black life. Um, and but I will say from my experience, this was when I was pastoring in D.C. and the Mid-Atlantic CBF was the first time that I can remember when I was in a leadership position and it wasn't tokenism, but also people wanted to hear my voice and wanted to follow my leadership. I didn't feel like I had to prove myself and I didn't feel like I was challenged, you know, and that was um, such a new and, and, and refreshing experience for me. And I've had I've had don't get me wrong, I've had other experiences in meetings and um, and I've listened to people correct themselves, not sure why that they had to affirm what I was saying was right <laughs> to themselves. You know what I mean? Because they weren't used to having, um, I guess, somebody black with an opinion that they agreed with or and or respected or what have you. And so but what I appreciate it is I've also watched those folks move from that position to shifting to just one of respect and, and, and mutual respect in the in the journey. And so I guess the best way I would frame it is CBF in itself, I think, is on this journey. And I appreciate that there are people who are willing to, to be courageous and do some things that are uncomfortable and sit in discomfort. I appreciate the fact that people are willing to try some things and risk making mistakes, but also asking for forgiveness and to, re, you know, to start all over again. But also that, you know, this denomination, even in its inclusion work, as we're trying to build and go and build towards a beloved community, that CBF is willing to raise the resources and invest um, in the development of inclusion work in black voices, black leadership. And as we look at inclusion for CBF, not looking at just including those churches that need support, but looking at churches that are healthy and well that don't need CBF and happen to be black and want them at the table and see them as resource and not somebody that they have to save and or rescue. Um, and I think for me, a defining moment, and I'll end right here, is that at a, at a governing board meeting and to hear the moderator at that time, Gary Dollar say that diversity um, and inclusion is the most important work right now. And we're going to need black leadership to help guide this because if we knew how to do it, we would have and we don't. And for them to understand black leadership is important to help guide the work of diversity in CBF life. Wow, yeah. And, and, and the great part about that, the words you use is it's a journey. And what I, what I like about the term that you use and the aspect of it being a journey is, you know, on a journey, there are many uh, tributaries, there are many uh, stumbling blocks, there's many mountains, there's many valleys, and sometimes there's streams and rivers you have to cross over. And the good part about it is on that journey, you make friends. On that journey, you have people to help you up that you're also able to help up. And, and what you've spoken to in all those experiences are aspects of us seeing how along the journey we've strengthened each other along the way. Now, if there's anyone that can speak to the journey, Dr. McCall, I know you can speak to the journey. Brothers and sisters, Dr. McCall was with CBF before it was CBF. He was with the Southern Baptist, right? So he knows a little bit about being a minority in a majority setting. And Dr. McCall, I would be remiss if I just didn't have you talk about the journey before the journey started, while on the journey, and while the journey is continuing. What things have you seen? And how do you feel looking at CBF on this side versus being on the on the end before even CVF was started? Like what, what's going through your mind? I've had the joy of serving on the governing council twice. The first time began in 2004. And uh, from that, uh, I became moderator, national moderator with the, the year before, the year of, and the year after those three years, never once, did I have any uncomfortable experiences as the national moderator of people disrespecting or talking down to or not expecting the better of me? It was for me a joyful experience. 
uh, as a member of the governing council, my ideas were requested, my suggestions were received, uh, information was shared, and it was for me a blessed experience. And I didn't think I'd come back and have that opportunity again, but I did. And uh, this last time, being elected to the governing council, uh, I was especially was in, was pleased to be included in the selection of the next executive director. That to me was that they wanted me there. I was asked to be on the governing council because they valued what my opinion would be. And I had the privilege of uh, in that council, in the uh, special committee, search committee, uh, I was expected to ask the kind of questions that would make other people comfortable or, dis, or, or uncomfortable. And uh, I had the freedom to do that, and I did. I'm also happy to say that when the final result was before us, I was the one who made the motion that Paul Baxley be our next executive coordinator. And I've not regretted, not for one moment, the fact that I voted in that direction because Paul has upped the leadership tick for us. Um, one of the things that happened right after the Black Lives Matter campaign started, uh, there was concern about how CBF would express itself. Paul came forward with a statement and he gave the governing uh, council the privilege of um, scrutinizing it, uh, offering any suggestions. We did. But what was for me the most beautiful thing was that there were at least six pages of pastors and people in the CBF who signed their names to that document, which meant that they were standing with the African-American community in what was a tremendous river to cross. And um, I'm grateful for, for the privilege of serving at those levels in the organization. But I'm also happy that there are young men like you, Charles, and like Jewel, and of course, Casey. Casey is a member of my church. You know, I, as I was retiring, uh, she became a part of us and Really, she shared the preaching with me, the leadership and the preaching, and we tag team preached uh, for a revival and a couple of other experiences. But uh, I, I'm re I'm rejoicing that there are young people who are gifted, who have been received, and who will have the opportunity of sharing those gifts nationally, as I've had the privilege. Okay, and that that is. That is excellent, just, just all of the wisdom and what you've been able to impart, not only verbally, but just the visual of seeing you, you know, uh, operate and your gift and your calling, the relationships that you've you've built. Uh, I've, I've just admired just watching you be in a CBF uh, gathering or a CBF um, event and how everyone just flocks towards you and just you, you just have this energy shield where you just pull people in and everyone knows who you are. Sometimes so many people are around you, you can't even see you, you know, you and I are about the same height. So, so, so you know, it, it, it gets to the point where, where I'm like, man, this guy is popular. I want to be like him one day, you know. But um, that, nonetheless, what I would like to wrap up is just with some of our hopes for CBF. And I, I think that something that I would like to see personally for CBF is for one to continue what it's doing with engaging college students. The internship program is excellent. The um, student.go program is an excellent program, which Taisha works with that I really enjoyed and got to interact with so many students, but also student.church as well, just engaging students that help shape the minds of young college students around ministry and defining what CBF is, but also um, with its hiring, I, I would like to see CBF to continue to hire not only African-Americans, but other minority groups, you know, because it's through the diversity in the office that we are introduced to different cultures, different thought processes and mindsets. But I would also like to challenge CBF in the sense of sometimes during Black History Month, sometimes when we have these conversations where, you know, we want to make sure that uh, or where CBF wants to make sure that African-Americans are heard, 
in those settings, there are times when a lot of times our white counterparts do not speak as much. But I want you to say that your voice is equally as important. Because what one of my friends helped me realize, black history isn't only black people's history, but it's also white folks' history too. Amen? That we're not in isolation with our history. So therefore, you also have a voice at the table that needs to be heard. When Black History Month comes around, don't just make it all black folks. You need to get some white folks in here to speak to. Amen. One thing that stood out to me, uh, Stephanie Vance talked to me uh, one time about an experience that she had had in her church in Alabama. I think it was in Judson. And she talked about how many of the people that participated in keeping out African-Americans from going to vote when, when Martin Luther King came to Selma and, and all the whites in that area stood up and didn't let them in and they got in that fight at the Edmonds Pet, Pettis Bridge and all that stuff, some of those people are still alive. And she talked about to this day on, the, on their deathbeds, some of those people want to have some sense of reconciliation because they feel as though they weren't even able to have the conversation about how they felt now moving from that time period in their lives to this one. And I think it'd be great to see CBF move to a space where it can allow people, maybe from the past or maybe in the present, that may have had racist um, sentiments at one time, that have had transformative thinking now and need to talk about that, may need to have more of the hard conversation, not just where Black folks are speaking, but where also people of different colors and races are speaking. And that's what I, I would like to see uh, as far as CBF moving forward. Casey, what would you like to see? I think similar to you is I like to see CBF continue to be on this journey of transformation to continue to um, and like you, especially since we're talking about Black History Month and Black life and Black community, I still like to see a growing number of my white brothers and sisters willing to be courageous, willing to risk discomfort and to, to operate in such a way um, that fear gets diminished and faith is raised so that that more transformation can take place. And I'm looking for co-labors that will relieve me of some of the burden that we carry uh, when it comes to equity, because it's a heavy load. Um, it's weary. I'm weary sometimes. And it's nice that I don't have to be the one to ask the question, raise the issue or the concern. I love it when I have a white brother and sisters that says, well, wait a minute, we haven't heard or this person is missing. This isn't right. And I can just sit there and nod my, ses my head and say, amen. I wholeheartedly agree. And I would echo what Casey has said. And I would also like to offer, uh, I appreciate that CBF has been extremely intentional in working towards uh, diversity. Uh, we're seeing it more and more as it relates to governance board, uh, et cetera. You've mentioned you'd like to see it in staff. Uh, I would like to see it in the churches. And what I mean by that is um, having uh, intentionally involving, considering um, African-American leadership. It's one thing to say that you support it. Uh, it's another thing to actually follow it. Uh, when we start seeing African-American uh, pastors in CBF church, uh, and not just rural churches, but actually um, staple churches, uh, when we start in and, and the congregations, white congregations actually following their leadership on a regular basis, when it gets to the point where uh, not just African-American, but African-American women uh, pastors and leaderships. Uh, and so though the percentage in CBF churches is higher, probably uh, predominantly as it relates to uh, female pastors, there are very few African-American pastors. Uh, and that is whether they are male or female. And so uh, pastoral leadership is important. And though we are still in the most segregated hour on Sunday morning, and we may never reach the degree that we'd like to see until we reach heaven, um, I, I just want to for it to get to the point where it's uh, not only in a denominational level, but also in the congregational, the church level. Um, and then I would like to see, as it relates to CBF, uh, a greater sense of intentionality as it relates to our younger leadership that's coming up behind us. Um, uh, I know that there are cultural differences as it relates to camps and 
programs that we attend. Uh, but when you talk about scholarship and uh, theological perspective, et cetera, I'd like to see some of our younger black theologians uh, rise up in uh, the network and that, you know, and, and I say this respectfully because Dr. McCall has set an example for us, but the greatest, the greatest, um, the greatest attention that we can show to his legacy is by making sure that there are more McCalls coming along the way. Um, and that, that's very important uh, to make sure that we're continuously raising up uh, leadership. And that th those are definitely some things I think we'd all like to see when, when it comes to leadership, when it comes to those scholarships, getting more people of color in those, all of those things are great things. Dr. McCall, we want to close out with what you, what you would like to see uh, as far as CBF moving forward. Well, everything that you've said, I say amen to. Um, if I had one regret, it's the fact that I'm 85 now, and that means I will not have the energy to be as active in CBF as I have been. But whether I'm here or in heaven, I'll be saying, right on, folks, right on. <laughs> right on. That's all right. That's all right. I like that. That's good. That's good. We always have to have the word of wisdom from Dr. McCall. Amen. But brothers and sisters, I thank you all for joining us uh, tonight for our CBF gathering. I thank all of our panelists tonight, Dr. McCall, uh, Ms. Jewel London, uh, Reverend Casey Jones. I just thank you all so much for giving your insight, giving your input and experiences with CBF. But one thing we must always keep in mind, that somewhere I read, maybe you've read it too in this Bible, that it reminds us that we are many members, but one body. And when it talks about us being many members in one body, that, 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 that doesn't mean that we're all the same race. That doesn't mean that we're all the same gender. That doesn't mean we all believe the same or love the same way. But brothers and sisters, regardless of all that, we are still a part of this body of Christ. And I think as long as CBF continues to move forward and work together to embrace this diversity, we can be a stronger fellowship on our journey along the road. Amen. 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 God bless you all. I look forward to seeing you all in the future post-pandemic. And may God keep you. Talk to you later.